My name is Marco, and today is about getting started with time series forecasting in Python. As you may know, I'm writing a book, Time Series Forecasting in Python with Manning. Um, so this book has really four key skills, recognize the time series forecasting problem, build univariate and multivariate forecasting models, uh, also leverage large data sets using deep learning models, and then we conclude the book with automating the forecasting process uh, with some of the automated forecasting libraries that there are out there. Uh, really the main uh, differentiating point uh, of this book is that everything is in Python, and I also make sure to include tons of real life scenarios and use cases for us to practice what we learn, uh, as well as capstone projects with full solutions available. Uh, so really, uh, I think really interesting and really a great way to apply what we learn. So uh, this presentation here really focuses on the basics, the fundamentals of time series forecasting. So concepts that will come back over and over again as we learn um, more about time series forecasting. And so we first answer the question, what a time series is. And so simply a time series is a set of data points ordered in time, right? So it is data that was recorded uh, with equal spaces in time. So recorded every hour, minute, day, month, quarter, etc. Uh, so here's an example of a time series, right? So this is the monthly uh, number of anti-diabetic drug prescriptions in Australia. So this is an example of data that is recorded every month. Okay. Um, here we have another example of a time series. In this case, it is quarterly data. So it is the quarterly earnings per share for the company Johnson & Johnson. So it is recorded every three months in a year. And here we have another uh, time series example, uh, which is traffic volume. So the number of cars that are passing through an interstate road. Uh, and so in this case, uh, it is recorded every hour. And so of course it makes sense, right? So during the day, you're gonna have some peaks uh, throughout the day, so maybe right before work and right after work, and then at night, uh, traffic is really uh, low, pretty much. Nobody is using the roads anymore. So those are all examples of time series uh, data sets, and this is the type of um, data that we learn to forecast uh, with time series, right? And so every time series can really be broken down into three components, okay? The first component is the trend, and that represents the long-term change in the time series. So this is what is responsible for the time series to either increase or decrease over time. And sometimes you can have no trend at all, right? And so your time series is neither increasing or decreasing. Uh, then we have the seasonal component, which is when we see a periodic pattern in a time series. So this is like the repeated uh, fluctuations that occur over a fixed period of time. And then finally, we have the residuals, which is noise or irregularities that are not explained by the trend or the seasonal component. So here's an example you know, of time series decomposition. So at the very top, we have the observed uh, data sets, which is your time series data, as you would see it. So in this case, it is the uh, number of monthly air passengers. Uh, and then we decompose the time series into its components. So uh, the second plot, you see the trend. So of course, as you can see, we have a time series that over the long term is increasing over time. And this is what the trend component is telling us. Uh, it is also increasing over time. So that's great. Then we have the seasonal component. And the seasonal component really captures what, you, what we call uh, the periodic fluctuations in the time series, okay? So as you can see, every year it's going up and down and up and down. And this is what the seasonal component is telling us. And finally, we have the residuals, which is any variations in the time series that are not explained by the trend and the seasonal component. So as you can see, the residuals, they seem a bit random. They go up, they go down, sometimes positive, sometimes negative. And so, uh, when you add all those components back, so if you add the residuals with the seasonal component and the trend component, you're going to get back your observed data. So this is very exciting, right? Uh, we know what a time series are, we know its components, we want to forecast them. However, this is not always, uh, we cannot always forecast all time series that we will encounter. And one example of that is uh, when we encounter a random walk. So a random walk is an example of a time series that we cannot reasonably forecast. So let's understand why. So here's an example of a random walk, okay? Actually, this is the closing price of uh, the Alphabet stock price, uh, which has the ticker Google. Uh, this, is, this was taken from May 2020 to end of May 2021. So as you can see, there is some kind of trend, right? So it's increasing over time. Uh, sometimes it's going up, sometimes it's going down. Etc. So we want to know, uh, can we actually forecast the daily closing price of Google? Okay. Well, first we need to first identify, is it a random walk or not? 
Because if it is a random walk, then we can't really re uh, reasonably forecast it. So a random walk is defined as a process in which there is an equal chance of going up or down by a random number. And this type of data is usually observed in financial and economic data. So mathematically, uh, we say that the random walk, uh, the present value yt, depends on a constant uh, denoted as c, the past value of the time series denoted as yt minus 1, so just the value of the time series but one step before, and an error term epsilon t. And so this is the mathematical expression of a random walk. And already we can see why we cannot reasonably forecast a random walk, right? Because basically, we can say that uh, the future value right here, yt, is only dependent on the present value plus some kind of random number. And of course, we cannot reasonably forecast a random number because it is random in the end, OK? So it's very important to recognize when we have a random walk process. And this is the kind of procedure that we follow to identify a random walk process. So first of all, we'll gather the data. Of course, we need data to work with time series forecasting. And then we'll check for stationarity. So we'll check, is our series stationary? And if it is not the case, then we need to apply a transformation until the series is stationary. And once that is the case, we plot the ACF, okay, or the autocorrelation function. And then when we look at the ACF, we'll determine, is there autocorrelation? If there is no autocorrelation, we say it is a random walk. Otherwise, we have something else. So I know there is a lot of new concepts that I've just introduced here, so let's take the time to go through each one of them. So first of all, stationarity, what it is. A stationary process is defined as having a constant statistical properties over time. Therefore, the mean, the variance, and the autocorrelation are constant. They do not depend with time. So let's show you an example. Here in orange, we have an example of a non-stationary process. And in blue, we have an example of a stationary process. Already, we can see that the orange process, uh, the non-stationary one, has some kind of trend, right? It first decreases, and then it decreases over time. However, looking at the blue process, the stationary process, there's no really trend in here, right? It seems to hover around the same value throughout time. This is just a quick way for you to um, already get a, get a hint that you may be working with a random walk or not. Uh, but of course, we will see how to uh, test it statistically. Um, but so now let's take a look at the statistical properties of these two processes to see if uh, one of them is constant uh, or not. So here we take a look at the mean of the time series over time. So again in blue, as you can see for the stationary process, once you give it a few time steps for the mean to stabilize, the mean stays fairly constant over time. It does not change anymore. However, for the orange process, as you can see, the mean changes drastically over time, which is really, so now we can see, you know, for a stationary process, the mean stays constant, but for a non-stationary process, the mean is really a function of time. And the same happens with the variance. So again, giving a few time steps for the variance to stabilize, and you see a blue flat line uh, telling us that the variance is indeed um, constant over time for the stationary process. However, looking again at the orange line for the non-stationary process, variance is again a function of time. It is changing. In order to make our series stationary, we need to apply transformations. And the most common transformation that we apply uh, to render uh, time series stationary is called differencing. So differencing is very simple. We actually just take the difference between consecutive time steps. Okay, so as you can see here at the very top, we have our original time series starting at y0 all the way to the end. And then we apply a first order differencing, which is simply we're going to take the difference between each consecutive time step. So here we do y1 minus y0, and then y2 minus y1, y3 minus y2, so on and so forth. And then the result is, a, is what we call a differenced time series. And note that for the very first time step, we lose one data point because at y0, there is no previous time step with which to, uh, to take the difference, okay? So every time we difference, we lose one data point. Important to keep that in mind. And that is very simple to do in Python. So of course, this is time series forecasting in Python, right? Uh, so in Python, very simple uh, using the library NumPy. So anyone who has done data science uh, has probably used NumPy. Uh, so they, it comes with the uh, diff method, which in which we simply pass in our data, and then we specify 
uh, n, which is the order of differencing. So in this case, n is equal to 1 for a first order differencing. So that means that we're going to be differencing uh, between consecutive steps. And then once we have difference our series, you know, we need to test for stationarity. And the way to do that, we apply a statistical test called the Augmented Dickey-Fuller Test, or for short, we call it the ADF test. And the ADF test is what we use uh, to test for stationarity. And its null hypothesis is uh, a unit root is present, therefore the series is not stationary. And so in order to reject the null hypothesis, we need to have a p-value that is less than 0 0.05. Uh, in that case, you know, we reject the null hypothesis, and so we conclude that the series is stationary. And again, uh, running the ADF test is very straightforward with Python, so we use the library stats models uh, that applies a bunch of uh, uh, statistical models, especially for time series forecasting, very, uh, very useful. So from stats models, we can simply import the add fuller function. Uh, and so as you can see, so we first difference our uh, random walk, and then we test it using the ADF uh, test, and we simply pass in our difference random walk. And then we can print out uh, both the ADF statistic and the p-value. The ADF statistic, by the way, is simply a, a negative number. So for a, a stationary process, the ADF statistic will be a large negative number. Uh, however, I don't recommend uh, only placing your conclusion on the ADF statistic because a large negative number is somewhat subjective. So always print out the p-value and really use that uh, to make your, de your decision. Uh, in this case, if the p-value is less than 0 0.05, like I said, you can safely uh, reject the null hypothesis and conclude that your time series is stationary. And then once uh, we know that we have a stationary process, we can then plot the ACF, uh, which, is, which stands for autocorrelation function. The autocorrelation function simply measures the correlation of a time series with itself at past values, which we also call lagged values. Okay, so past values and lagged values means the same thing. And this is the kind of result that you get. Uh, so as you can see, uh, first at lag zero, we always have an autocorrelation coefficient of one. That makes sense, right? Because this simply means what is the correlation of y0 with y0, okay? So what is the correlation of a value with itself? That's always gonna be equal to one, right? Because the value uh, with itself, it's always equal, okay? And then we look, what is the correlation of a present value with its past value? And then with two values prior to that, and then three values prior to that, and so on and so forth. So this is what the x-axis is telling us, is how many lags uh, we are comparing to. And so here actually is an example of an autocorrelation function that shows no autocorrelation, okay? So you might notice this uh, white, this, uh, sorry, this um, pale blue rectangle here. And that shows the uh, confidence uh, significance interval, okay? So if your autocorrelation coefficients, represented by these dots here, is within this pale uh, blue rectangle, it means that they are not significantly different from zero. And so you can say that the, the coefficients are not significant, so there is no autocorrelation. However, if they are um, outside of this pale uh, blue rectangle, then your, co then your coefficients are significant, and you must consider that there is autocorrelation. So looking at this ACF, okay, uh, this is a typical ACF of a random walk, okay, or random uh, noise here because we will, we will always have an autocorrelation coefficient of one at lag zero, and then nothing will be significant at future lags. And again, to plot the ACF, very simple. We use again the stats models library that has the plot ACF function in there. And again, we simply pass it uh, our difference uh, process. In this case, it is a stationary process. And then you can specify the number of lags, which simply tells you how far you go on the x-axis. So in this case, we put lags equal 20, which is why you see here, we go from zero all the way to 20. And now let's check if Google is a random walk, okay? So we follow the same process. So we had our Google data, we differenced it to make it stationary, and then we plot the ACF function, and this is the ACF function that we get. So as you can see, of course, at zero, we have our uh, correlation coefficient of one, that's fine. But then as you move out, you see nothing is significant besides this one here at lag five. 
So what happened here, okay? This sometimes can happen, okay? Um, you might have, by chance, a significant coefficient, okay? Why do I say it is by chance? It's because there are no consecutive uh, significant coefficients, okay? It's really at zero, we have one, and then nothing is significant, and then we just have this little blip here at like five, and then nothing is significant anymore, okay? That's why I say it occurs by chance, and sometimes it happens. But from this here, we can really say that, well, the daily closing price of Google seems to be a random walk. And so it's probably not really reasonable to try to predict it. And actually, we have to be very careful when we forecast a random walk because we're only left uh, with uh, using very naive methods, okay? And here, here's an example of uh, me trying to forecast a random walk, okay? So we have the actual values in blue, and then in red, we have the forecasts. Now, if we were to evaluate uh, such a model, you know, maybe measure its MSE, uh, its mean squared error, or its mean absolute error, we would get some very low scores trying to, you know, hinting us that we actually built a very good model. But if we look closely uh, at it, the only thing that we did is that we're simply predicting uh, the actual time step to be the same in the future. So what we're saying here is that, well, whatever the closing price it was today, all I'm saying is that it is going to be the same the next day. And then when you think about it, you're only going to be off by a very small random number. Okay. Uh, so it seems like to be a very smart forecast, a very good forecast, where in fact, we're not doing anything intelligent here. Uh, so be careful uh, when you're forecasting a random walk uh, or when you see forecasts of random walks like this, uh, because we might think that it's a very good, but in fact, there's nothing really uh, smart going on here.